The year is 2008, and the movie kicks off in Montenegro, where we meet CIA agent Peter Devereaux. He's a seasoned pro in the spy world, known as the November Man, because, well, nothing lives after he passes through. Peter's the type who gets things done, a man known for his precision and quick thinking. But what sets him apart is his commitment to doing what's right. He approaches one of his trainees, Mason, who's busy playing a game of saliva swap with his girl. Peter tries to school Mason on the downsides of PDA for someone who works for the CIA. He paints a scenario for Mason, warning him that if he becomes a target, his girlfriend could be kidnapped, endangering not only Mason, but also his fellow agents and sensitive information. To make his point clear, Peter points out a suspicious guy nearby with a camera. After all, Mason's advice to Peter is simple. You feel the need for a relationship? Get a dog. To everyone who clicked on this video expecting quality content and got my video instead, your support means the world, and a like would be the cherry on top. In the next scene, Peter, Mason, and another agent named Hanley are cruising in a black Mercedes, all set to escort the U.S. ambassador. While Peter playfully gives the one-finger salute to Mason and puts on his body armor, Hanley suddenly shares the bad news. Reliable sources have warned them about an assassination attempt on the ambassador today. Upon learning this, Mason gets the sniper duty, while Peter rushes to pick up the ambassador. Black cars arrive at the drop-off point, and Mason takes position in a nearby building. He scans the area for potential targets fitting the given description, a Caucasian in his mid-30s to 40s. Mason tells Peter to call off the operation because he can't find the target, but Peter chooses to proceed anyway. He acts as the ambassador, hoping that the assassin's gonna show up. During this process, Peter spots the target but instructs Mason to hold his fire. The assassin advances toward the decoy ambassador, firing multiple shots. Peter's body armor protects him, and Mason fatally shoots the assassin. Tragically, a kid also ends up in Mason's line of fire and gets killed, leading Peter to blame Mason for not following orders that caused a kid to die. Five years later in Lausanne, Switzerland, Peter has retired and now runs a cozy coffee shop by the lake. Out of nowhere, Hanley drops by to deliver some news about the recent grisly murders of their co-workers in Belgrade. The killer has been identified by Hanley. It's a Russian woman who's working for Arkady Fedorov, a potential future Russian president trying to bury his dark past by silencing anyone in the know. Peter doesn't seem interested at first, but then Hanley brings up a woman named Natalia, who seems to have been recruited by Peter. Hanley says that Natalia got very close to Arkady Fedorov and that she holds critical information about the man that could pose a significant risk to her, a name that could change everything. Finally, Hanley says that Natalia personally asked for Peter to bring her out and somehow he manages to convince him to do it. In the next scene, we get to know today's politician and ex-military man, Arkady Fedorov. He's up there giving his speech in the Russian parliament when his supposedly loyal right-hand assistant, Natalia, seizes the moment to slip into his office and access his safe. She finds some girl's pictures inside and quickly snaps them with her phone. Soon enough, Arkady wraps up his speech and heads back, leaving Natalia scrambling to tidy up. When Arkady comes back, Natalia plays it cool but makes a quick exit from the office. However, Arkady later notices his safe is open. Outside the parliament, a CIA extraction team is following Natalia's car with a drone and a van. Leading the pack is Mason, with Hanley back at the U.S. Embassy in Belgrade calling the shots. They're set to meet Natalia in a certain spot in five minutes, which is odd since Hanley told Peter to bring her out. Everything seems to be going smoothly until an FSB armored car starts chasing Natalia. The Russians eventually corner Natalia, but suddenly Peter intervenes by running over one of them. After a tussle where Peter kills a few agents, he finally manages to get Natalia out of the mess. Peter's sudden appearance catches everyone off guard from the team members who fail to recognize him to Natalia herself, who gets a close look at him. However, Hanley is the only one who remains completely unfazed. Natalia then starts talking about how much she missed Peter and a girl named Lucy, which indicates their incredibly close bond. In the meantime, a high-ranking official from the CIA headquarters named Weinstein goes online and orders Mason an extraction, which of course is faced with Hanley's rubber band resistance. No, Perry, you can't! Mason and his team make their way to the rooftop of a building, armed with his sniper rifle. At the same time, Peter asks Natalia for the name she knows and passes it on to Hanley, Mira Filipova. Hanley's response to that is, Peter, you're blown. Then things go from zero to a hundred real quick. Mason takes aim at Natalia and shoots her relentlessly, leaving Peter in shock. In her final moments, Natalia hands her phone to Peter. After kissing her on the forehead, Peter notices a drone landing on the roof of a nearby building. As soon as the CIA van makes its way out of the building, Peter goes on a rampage and takes out everyone, except for Mason. After gazing at each other, they both depart leaving behind a scene as Mason blows up the van. Peter hops into a cab and starts checking out the photos on the phone Natalia gave him. Then he takes out the memory card and throws the phone away. On the other hand, Mason tells the crew that the person he faced off with was actually Peter, 
Weinstein puts two and two together, realizing the connection between Peter and Hanley. Meanwhile, Hanley has arrived home and is searching for Mira Filipova, the name Peter gave him. Suddenly, the CIA strike team storms his place. To stop them from getting the info, he fires multiple shots at his computer. Back at his apartment in Belgrade, Mason spots the neighbor's cat in his place and returns it to her. This neighbor happens to be an American woman who seems keen on spending time with Mason, but he gets interrupted by a private call. Later, two more arrivals hit Belgrade, Peter and Alexa, Fedorov's hired assassin. Meanwhile, a reporter for the New York Times named Edgar Simpson goes to meet Alice Fournier, a social worker at the refugee center, and asks her for information about Fedorov. Alice is the contact officer for refugee girls like Mira Filipova. Alexa heads to a gaming cafe where she connects with a hacker. He informs her that Mira's last trace was a decade ago, but her contact person in the Belgrade Refugee Center is still reachable. With some digging, he uncovers the address and time of Alice and Edgar's meetup from their emails and hands it to Alexa. Meanwhile, Weinstein, who has already arrived in Belgrade, questions Mason about why he didn't kill Peter when he had the chance. He shows Mason some covertly taken photos of Peter and Natalia, revealing their close relationship. Weinstein then instructs Mason to eliminate Peter because he's 100% sure that Peter's gonna get his revenge. With that said, Mason has no choice but to follow the order. Peter is now at Hanley's apartment, where he finds two CIA agents trying to recover Hanley's computer. The hard drive is okay, and Mira's info can be seen on the screen. While both agents are distracted, Peter catches them off guard and knocks them unconscious. Back at the U.S. Embassy, Mason and another agent named Celia receive a photo of Peter at the airport, which was taken four hours ago. They are then contacted by the cleaners at Hanley's, requesting information on Alice's phone number and location, which Celia easily provides. Suddenly, Mason has a gut feeling and asks Celia to contact the other agent. When there's no response, they realize that the call was actually from Peter. When he gets to the spot, Peter sees Alice chatting with Edgar. Their conversation makes it clear that the refugee girls Alice helped were somehow connected to Fedorov's past. However, Alice believes Fedorov is too powerful to be stopped. Meanwhile, Alexa swings by their table, pretending to be a waitress and tells Alice she's got an urgent work call saying her phone is not working. Despite what Alexa said, Alice's phone suddenly rings. It's Peter on the line, warning Alice that the lady she's with is a dangerous assassin. When Alexa goes for a knife, Peter tells Alice to run away, but then the CIA storms in and the chase kicks off. Peter knocks one agent off his bike, grabs Alice, and they dash through the kitchen. Mason receives a call from Peter, and despite his attempts to locate him, Peter just mocks him. Later, Alice wants to know what's going on, but Peter insists that she trust him if she wants to stay safe. Playing along, Alice pretends to be alone. When an agent pursues her, Peter swiftly disables him with an elbow strike, tampers with his phone, and then walks away. Soon, Mason catches up with the injured agent and gets another call from Peter. He tries prolonging the call in order to trace it, but Peter's cool with that. They figure out the call's coming from the beaten agent's phone, so all they could track was his phone. As their conversation continues, they engage in a mental battle, trying to outsmart each other, but Peter's the champ at this game. He smashes a car window, triggers its alarm, and then messes with the fuel pipe. Mason and his crew hear the alarm and head over to check out the car. Little do they know, Peter's already hot-wired another car with Alice in it. He fires at the gasoline, causing the other car to explode and allowing them to make a clean escape. The next scene shows Alexa chasing Edgar. In the car, Peter starts explaining why the CIA and the assassin are after Alice, asking if she knows anything about Mira Filipova. When they hit the refugee center, Alice hands over Mira's file saying she vanished three years back with no trace. Then, out of the blue, Peter spots a picture of someone Alice calls Lebedinko, a well-known pimp. But Peter tells her the guy's real name is Simi Denisov, Fedorov's right-hand man in the last Chechen war. Alice knows where they can find Denisov, so they decide to pay him a visit. They meet Denisov at his strip joint, where he welcomes them warmly, showing he's tight with Peter. Peter warns him that Fedorov's wiping out anyone who knows about his old war crimes, warning that Denisov could be next. Peter is curious about what Fedorov did in the past. In response, Denisov reveals the truth about an operation ordered by Fedorov. It involved blowing up a building and making it look like the Chechens did it, which resulted in the deaths of numerous Russian soldiers and started the Second Chechen War. But it also gave Russia access to oil reserves. Now Fedorov's trying to cover up his role in that operation. Putting that aside, Peter is more shocked to learn that the operation was handled by the CIA. The following day, we see Hanley being interrogated by Celia. Acting arrogant, he puts her down and questions her ability to conduct an interrogation. Show me your Over in Weinstein's office, Mason is being blamed for losing Peter. Weinstein thinks Mason idolizes Peter, so he hands him a flash drive, saying it's got Peter's thoughts on him. Mason checks it and finds rejection letters from Peter regarding his qualifications, as well as photos of Peter and Natalia. He then finds the neighbor's cat in his apartment again. 
He tries to return it, but this time, Sarah the neighbor comes straight out and asks him on a date. Peter picks up a few burner phones before he sneaks into an apartment close to Mason's with Alice. He stands by the window, checks Mason's apartment, and eventually catches him heading out with Sarah. As she plays the piano, Alice accidentally utters a Russian word, leaving Peter puzzled. She reveals that her parents were university professors who taught her some Russian. After a wild night at the club, Mason and Sarah head back to his place and things get heated. Meanwhile, across the street, Peter gets dressed and breaks the news to Alice that he can't stay with her anymore. He gives her some cash and a phone and tells her to hide somewhere safe. When Mason wakes up, he realizes Sarah's gone, but then he gets a text from her phone. He goes to check his gun, but it's missing too. As he heads to the kitchen, he finds Peter holding Sarah at gunpoint. Mason tries to calm the situation, but Peter starts playing mind games with Sarah. He puts it in question whether Mason really cares about her or not. Peter tags Mason as a murderer for the child's death in 2008 and also for Natalia's death, believing that he always picks the wrong path. Nonetheless, he decides to test Mason once more, holding a knife to Sarah's throat and giving his gun to Mason. When Mason reaches for the gun, Peter cuts Sarah's femoral artery on her right leg. Now Mason must decide between saving Sarah or pursuing Peter, whom the CIA wants eliminated. Fortunately, this time he prioritizes human life and rushes Sarah to the hospital, showing a change of heart. Fedorov arrives in Belgrade for the European Energy Conference, but first meets with Alexa to give her some directives. Later, as Edgar heads home, he unexpectedly encounters Alice, who is now eager to divulge all she knows about Fedorov, including details about Mira. However, when Edgar goes to get a recorder, Alexa emerges from hiding and slashes his neck. Subsequently, Alexa attempts to harm Alice too, but Edgar intervenes, allowing Alice to run for her life. Mason takes a second look at Peter's photos, and after some more digging, he finds out Peter and Natalie had a daughter, a fact that even the CIA was unaware of. While Celia is still interrogating Hanley, suddenly Peter shows up at the place and knocks two of the guards unconscious. He then slips into Hanley's interrogation container with no trouble. He demands an explanation from Hanley about why Natalia was caught off guard when he showed up. Hanley begins spinning lies, claiming that the CIA suspected Natalia of betrayal and wanted her eliminated. He insists that he sent Peter to rescue her from both the Russians and the CIA. Hanley then tries to pretend he doesn't know anything about the CIA and Fedorov working together to start the Chechen war. But when he sees Peter's totally onto him, he introduces Weinstein as the mastermind behind the operation and the one who ordered Natalia's extraction. On top of that, he says Weinstein killed Natalia to prevent Mira Filipova from exposing his conspiracy with Fedorov. Lastly, Hanley provides Peter with some background info on Mira Filipova, a girl who's fluent in both English and Russian with parents who were both university professors. This leads Peter to deduce that Mira is none other than Alice. At the same time, Mason updates Weinstein on his investigation. He reveals that Peter has a 12-year-old daughter named Lucy and that they, along with Natalia, were in fact a family. Meanwhile, Mira approaches Denisov, asking to be sent to Fedorov as one of his girls. Despite Peter's efforts to talk her out of it, Mira is set on taking down Fedorov. When she reaches his room, she smashes a mirror in the bathroom, wraps tape around a shard of it, and hides it in her bra. While she's doing this, memories of her family's tragic death at the hands of Fedorov come rushing back. After that incident, Fedorov captured her and subjected her to numerous abuses. At the same time, Celia and Mason discover that the real Alice passed away in 2005 from cancer after digging through the CIA database. They also find a recording of Mira Filipova's voice, which matches the fake Alice's voice. Mira gets out of the bathroom and presses the mirror shard against Fedorov's neck before he can react. It doesn't take long for Fedorov to remember her. He starts reminiscing about their shared past, labeling those moments as his fondest memories. This emotional onslaught causes Mira to crumble mentally. In a sudden move, Fedorov flips the situation and overpowers Mira, pinning her to the bed. Meanwhile, Peter starts going Rambo and attacking Fedorov's hotel. After taking down several guards, he finally barges into Fedorov's room to rescue Mira. Peter instructs her to grab her phone so they can capture Fedorov's confession. Peter is determined to make Fedorov admit to his crimes and reveal his CIA connections. When Fedorov refuses, Peter resorts to a game of Russian roulette, forcing the general to confess that it was John Hanley he conspired with, blowing Peter's mind. As Peter steps outside, he finds himself in a shootout with CIA agents. Mason is also there, but he can't stop Peter. Peter tells Mira to go to a specific hotel, which she manages to do by evading the agents. Mason tails Peter into the basement, sparking a brawl between them. Eventually, Peter overpowers Mason and leaves him with Alice's phone. After finding Fedorov's confession on Mira's phone, Mason and Celia decide to break the news to Weinstein. But when they go to his office, they're taken aback to find Hanley there instead. Peter catches up with Mira at the hotel and spills his plan to keep her safe and off the radar forever. As they chat, Peter opens up about his past, 
mentioning he's a retired agent with a daughter in Lausanne. Peter tries calling his daughter, only to realize Hanley has snatched her up. It turns out he made a promise to the CIA directors to gain control over Fedorov and ended up taking Weinstein's position. Hanley then arranges a meeting with Peter the following morning at 8 a.m. to exchange Lucy for Mira. The following day, Peter tells Mira to head to the train station and get three tickets for their getaway. While she's busy with the tickets, Peter heads off to meet Hanley. Hanley makes up stories about how controlling Fedorov means controlling Russia, planning to make him join NATO once he's president to settle the conflicts. However, Peter seems to be aware of Hanley's deceptions. Why are you sweating? Hanley tries to ease Peter's worries by putting Lucy on the line, and in return, Peter feeds Hanley a false address for Mira. Celia, who managed to trace the call, sends Lucy's exact location to Mason. While on his way to find Mira, Mason takes an unexpected turn. Having discovered Hanley's corruption, Mason's not going to take orders from him anymore. He jams the other agent's buckle using a coin so he can't fasten his seatbelt. Next, he forcefully crashes the poor BMW into the wall, ensuring the agent is out of commission before moving on to rescue Lucy. Back at the train station, Mira suddenly realizes she's got some unfinished business to do. She finds a computer and begins typing everything she knows about Fedorov, intending to send it to the New York Times to continue Edgar's work. Unfortunately, Alexa manages to locate Mira at the train station thanks to the hacker. Following a special thank you to him, Alexa rushes to the station and swiftly spots Mira. As the two come face to face, Mira takes off running, causing Alexa to pursue her. Out of nowhere, Mira strikes Alexa with a shovel, knocking her unconscious before returning to her writing. Mason heads over to where Lucy's being held all by himself. He takes care of the bad guys, rescues Lucy, and gets back to Hanley's crew, blasting them away so Peter can step in and take control. However, Peter decides to show mercy. Peter meets his daughter once more, and they make their way to the station. Meanwhile, Mira wraps up her business and sends everything over to the New York Times, making sure to include all the evidence she's got. She also shares details about how Fedorov killed Edgar, ensuring his efforts do not go to waste. In the next scene, we can see Mira in a deposition with government officials where she reveals the truth about Fedorov's role in her family's murder and his shady dealings with CIA agent John Hanley, which led to the building explosion that started the Second Chechen War. The news spreads like wildfire, putting an end to Fedorov's presidential aspirations. In the final scene, Fedorov is seen chilling on a yacht with women, thinking that he's got nothing to worry about. But his luck runs out when a bullet finds its way to his head, putting an end to his life. And that's when the end credits roll in.